Happy Friday, you miserable accursed. We're back at it again. Jenny Byrne is with us from Ottawa, where they're still cleaning the blood off the floor from the CPC debate last night. Scott Reed is with us from his home, where they're still cleaning the blood off the floor from God knows what. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to fall for your de- I'm not taking your bait, David. I'm not going to lower myself to your level. I'm going to Patrick Brown this and just vacate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Allison from QP Today. How are you this morning? Hi, guys. What happened on the provincial campaign trail yesterday? What's likely to happen today? Well, what's likely to happen today is that Doug Ford is going to head out to Bowmanville. Everyone's still sticking around the the general GTA as perimeters today. Um, I think that come this weekend, they're going to start getting out a little bit further away. But so far, uh, you know, Kitchener and maybe Bowmanville seem to be the furthest anyone's flung. A uh, slight update on the Doug Ford itinerary front, actually, uh, on the on the schedule they sent to reporters yesterday, there was a very small little section at the bottom that added a, a handful of words that said that Doug Ford will be door knocking in and, and making campaign stops in Oshawa and the Durham region. So we're learning a little bit more about what he's doing every day. Uh, so an improvement on that front. Um Stephen Del Duca is going to be in Kitchener. He's going to be t- talking about making a, a major structural change to the education system, um, which I'm not sure Ooh. anybody's asking for, but maybe they are. Maybe he's going to kill Catholic schools. We know, this, it's, it, this is it class sizes, isn't it? Isn't this class sizes? Did that yesterday. Class sizes Did that yesterday. yesterday yeah. that oh, that's yesterday. right. Class sizes was yesterday. And he already has pledged publicly within the past week that he will not kill Catholic school boards. So, you know. Yeah, Yesterday he, he says he's going to boost. That. Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to tell. It'll be curious to see. Uh, and then Andrea Horvath going to Burlington talking about affordable housing. Um, she hasn't really highlighted their, the, the, the NDP has this plan to basically help new fo- home buyers purchase houses by uh, putting up 10% of their down payment, I believe. And then the government would own equity in the home until it gets sold. Uh, so that's been in their platform. She hasn't talked about that yet on the campaign trail, but that could be today. Uh, and then she's going back to Brampton, everyone's favorite uh, city this campaign, and she's going to be talking about health. Excellent. Excellent. Did you watch the debate last night? I did, actually. Yeah. I, I liked the uh, the metaphor that Sheree's uh, just secretly wearing a red shirt over a blue shirt over a red one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. QP today, sign up for your uh, daily newsletter. It's really helpful. I Personally, it's all I know. That's why how I can do this show. Just get it from uh, Allison. <laughs> That's, <right. laughs> That's great. I'll be here in spirit for the rest of the episode then. <laughs> Excellent. Have a, have a great weekend, Allison. Sure, yeah. It's at politicstoday.news. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Well... I don't know. There may have been a provincial campaign yesterday, but I don't think it was the most exciting or interesting political event of the day. Uh, Jenny, you're in Ottawa for the CPC debate. Um, how'd you feel it went? Yeah, I, th- I think it went fairly. Uh, I think it went fairly expected. I I, uh, uh, I was uh, a little bit surprised. I figured Sheree would be a little bit more. Uh, feisty, so to speak. I think he uh, uh, was a bit docile coming out of uh, coming out of the gate uh, in terms of uh, uh, how he how he handled the, the debate. But I think otherwise it was uh, it was pretty much uh, pretty much expected. So um, uh, in terms of uh, what the candidates, uh, what the candidates uh, brought up and what have you uh, and uh, in terms of how they uh, and how they answered the questions. And so, you know, uh, it's it's you know you know how debate days are, and so we've got two party debates uh, coming up uh, next week and the week after, one in Edmonton and one in uh, and one in Calgary. So uh, I thought uh, I thought it was I thought it was okay. As I said, the surprise to uh, the surprise to me was how uh, uh, how kind of uh, uh, docile uh, uh, Sheree ended up being. Lewis was aggressive, eh? What'd you make of that? Um, I think. Well, listen, I think that. Uh, Everyone is carving out a niche for themselves. There's three weeks left to go in terms of uh, just over three weeks left to go uh, in terms of uh, membership sales. A little, well, four weeks 
Anyways, it's it, it's <laughs> 27 days left to go in uh, number six sales. <laughs> so I think everyone's carving themselves out. Uh, everyone is trying to carve themselves out a uh, uh, to carve some, carve themselves out a niche in uh, a niche in, in 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 the race. Yeah, Scott, you get a chance to watch it last night. Yeah, I wasn't able to watch it live, so I went back and watched it on YouTube. Um, and uh, I don't know, Jenny. Like, uh, I don't, I don't. I didn't think that anybody lacked for feistiness. Like it was, it was a brutal situation. Like my favorite part was when. Well, no, wait Johnny a second. Charay yeah. Charay did show up initially without his napalm. Initially, but then after yeah. Pierre took the yeah. uh, took the taxes issue as an example, I think that was sort of the opening uh, battleground, right? And just jammed it up his ass. Uh, Charay uh, Charay came back. I mean, I just think it was so. Raw, so raw. I've never seen a debate like it among political leaders or people just calling each other names and just hammering on each other without without restriction. Like that's the thing. I've done debate prep for millions of leaders over the years. I've never seen um people just wheel on one another and just go like my favorite part was when Johnny Depp and Amber Heard came on stage and said, Folks, folks, please <laughs> act with some dignity. <laughs> You might be humiliating yourself. Like it was just, it was so raw. It was so raw. So I thought it was, I actually thought it was almost a, a new politics when you're watching it lively unfold because um, it'll be interesting to see how that translates to the general population. But it was, it was so savage. It wasn't people saying, I don't agree with you in your position. It was people saying, you, um, you were unfit, unqualified and indecent. Like it was just raw as hell. Um, and uh, I think that the federal liberals had better pay attention because Pierre's going to win this thing. John, you know, say it in front of Jenny. Pierre's going to win this thing. And I think he's going to be just like that when he turns on the liberal leader in a leadership debate. I don't know how voters will respond, but uh, the liberal leader in the next uh, leader's debate is going to have to ready themselves for the kinds of attacks and the kind of conduct that's never been witnessed before on the federal stage. Like, it just hasn't happened. So that was my takeaway. Uh, get ready, buy some armor, get an axe, because this thing is going to be the battle of Agent Core. Well, Paul, you have some good debater. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, he's got an extremely strong debating style. And, uh, you know, I mean, I... I Hard can't think. I can't think of how it, a person could stay, frankly, unflappable in the face of it. Um, so you, you know, there's got to be some techniques that people learn about how to handle debates. I think you know one of the interesting things about how direct it was between the candidates. I mean, I assume that the reason that that normally doesn't happen in a leadership debate, where they're normally much more genteel, is because everybody likes by and large, the people on the stage, to one degree or another, they're supporting a candidate, but they're all relatively popular members of the party. Like, you know, if if Paul had wheeled on Sheila Cobbs and just said a bunch of terrible things about her, which, you know, you and I regularly wrote for him to say, if he would have if he would have wheeled on her and said those said those things, you know, people in the audience would have said, well, you know, I'm not supporting Sheila for leader, but I kind of like Sheila. That was mean. Why'd you do that? No, you guys just fucked her over in a nomination later. <laughs> That's not quite the history, but I'm happy to reveal it. But anyway, jump in. So you 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 have a different take on this. You don't see it the same way Scott and I are talking about it. I, I listen. I actually think it was it was a very factual debate. I I don't think anything that was said on stage last night was anything that had not been said in the public in the public domain. I I you know in terms of. Uh, Pierre and Jean Charest's interaction with each other. Jean Charest, you know, his his biggest selling feature is that he's been in politics for 40 years and uh, he was the premier of Quebec. And so he has a track record for being the premier of Quebec. And so uh, when uh, when uh, when issues come up, Scott mentioned the issue on taxes. Charest had Charest had, no had nothing. And if if you were there in the room, I, I watched the debate live, obviously. Uh, when you were in there in the room, there were a lot of times that Charest had body language in terms of trying to interact in terms of what the other candidates were saying, not just Pierre, but, but other candidates, when it came to like his issue, his, his, his uh, record on taxes, he was very silent. He was very like, he, he couldn't, cause he did, he had, he did raise taxes several, several times. He did leave Quebec with a very large deficit. And so, um, I, uh, you know, these things are all very important in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of a conservative leadership debate. 
I can't believe how much Sheree was talking about national unity. I just don't understand. I mean, like, even people who are talking about how divided the country are, they're not talking about Quebec separatism or even Western separatism or any nation per se. They're talking about other divisions within the country. Um, you know, he seemed to be on a national unity track like it was the 80s or 90s. Yeah. Well, I, I, sorry, go, go ahead, Jane. Scott. No, I was oh. just going to listen. I'll just say one thing, and then I'll the, – the one thing I found uh, interesting is he, he said – uh, he, he he alluded to and then specifically said at one point in the debate, um, you know, I am the Bloc Québécois worst nightmare. I'm I'm coming I'm coming for you, Bloc. Well, he was part of a government the that he was part of a government that actually created both the Reform Party and the Bloc Québécois. So it's 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 a it's a very revisionist. He is a, he's very selective in terms of uh, the history that he likes to talk about in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, the history of. Uh, of uh, unity within the uh, within the uh, within the party or within the cons- within the c- country um, I, from you know forty years ago. Well, there was a lot of selectiveness going on. I mean, I don't. Know. I thought a lot of the discussion was cockeyed in my view, but that's because I have a different worldview. So one of the things I found fascinating with the debate was I got exposed in in large portions and in um, and in direct doses. Uh, to a uh, you know a different worldview, and I think it's going to be interesting how that translates into a, into a general election. But uh, the one thing I would say on Sheree, I don't agree with Jenny that he was docile because I thought that he when attacked he revved up and he tried to attack. It was not as effective as as Pierre. Pierre, in my view, wiped the walls with him. Um, but I think he was shocked. I think he was. I think he was startled and destabilized, and so I take it away. I come back to it. I think we saw a different kind of debate yesterday, one that we've not seen before, both uh, lowercase and uppercase D in terms of debate. And I just think, um, you know, when he sort of slides into, well, hang on, you know, I bring the country together, or talk about these things. This is my record, and that just gets hammered. Um, I think the federal liberals, Judo. Um, has, has got to look at that and go, okay, I can't be that guy. I can't be that. Like, I've got to figure out how to take that punch and get around it because I just can't, I can't wander in there thinking that we're, uh, we're you know, uh, at the ladies of the Eastern Star and it turns out it's the, uh, you know, it's the tyson Holyfield fight. Like, I just can't. So people are going to have to figure out how to, how, to, how to conduct themselves in that world. And Sheree, Sheree tried, but he ultimately wasn't able to. Well, everybody around Trudeau were in university debating, so they'll have a, they'll have a measure of how to handle this. Right. Therefore, yeah. let it be resolved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I promised you a honeybee story earlier this week, Hurley Burleyites, and I'm a man who delivers on all of his honeybee promises. It's from our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and more specifically, their $100 million pollinator fund for good one of the world's largest corporate social impact funds. Their mission? Partner with responsible startups who devote themselves to tackling the biggest social and environmental challenges of our generation, including supporting responsible agriculture, caring for the planet, transforming healthcare, and enabling inclusive communities. One of those businesses is Nectar, based in Montreal. Nectar uses precision beekeeping technology to help raise healthier honeybees. Specifically, they've developed a smartphone tracking tool, B-Track, that follows and tracks hives during the growing season. Honeybee health. Yep, now there's an app for that. And just in time. You've probably heard stories about the declining honeybee population. About 40% of American beehives have been dying each year, up from an average of 15% historically. B-Track will tell the beekeeper if the hive's location is poor or if it's full of unwanted pesticides and needs to be moved or if it needs disease treatment to survive. No small thing. Fully one-third of our crops today depend on managed bee pollination, everything from the almonds and blueberries you eat to canola seed. Startups simply can't develop technology like this in a black box lab. It takes a hell of a lot of doors being opened and real economies of scale to make systemic change for sustainability possible. Precisely what the TELUS Pollinator Fund for Good is here for. And you know how pollination spreads even more growth? When TELUS put their money into honeybees, other investors took notice too. Today, Nectar is closing in on 150,000 active hives, and they expect to double that number soon, making it the market leader. TELUS is a company driven by social purpose. 
And you can read more about their commitments in their sustainability and ESG report at telus.com slash sustainability. All right, let's move to the provincial campaign. As Allison told us, Del Duca was out yesterday on education, and he's out today on education. Horvath was out yesterday on health care, talking about dental care. She's back today on health care. So what we learned from Greg Lyle's polling was that the NDP were most credible on health care and the Liberals were most credible on education. And uh, we also learned that uh, education in particular was a relatively lo- was a lower order priority for most people than cost of living was. Healthcare also a lower order priority, but still more significant. But so both of these parties are playing to their strengths, not playing to the zeitgeist of the campaign, which is supposed to be about affordability. <clears throat> I presume they are trying to take what their strengths are and raise the salience of those issues within the campaign so that they are more important and the issues on which they are strong are more important to voters. Correct, Mundo Scott? Is that what they're doing? That, uh, that has to be the conclusion. Otherwise, it's just pure rational, right? So let's make the issue the issue upon which I am strong. Right. But, I'm, but I bet if you go back to polls in the last 20 years, the Liberals were strongest on education and the NDP were strongest on health care or vice versa or very close to it. I still don't, you know, I saw in uh, Allison's uh, brief this morning uh, that uh, gas in Timmins was uh, over two bucks a liter. It was close to that. I was up in Northern Ontario a week and a half ago, up in the Sioux, Sudbury, North Bay. And and so, um, uh, and it was close to that now, close to that then it was a, you know, you drive by a gas station, it's a $1.98 a, uh, a liter. And so I don't understand why they're not trying to change. We talked about this yesterday. I still don't know why they're not trying to change the focus. There are certain issues where we are always going to, at least in modern times, have the benefit um, uh, of the doubt in terms of voters, in terms of what we're good at. If you talk to, about taxes or the economy, conservatives always, uh, always are. There are exceptions to that. But for the most part, David, you would know this better than me, but there's always certain issues. And it's not res- it's not resonating or getting traction for either Horvath or for Del Duca for their parties. So I'm not sure why they're not trying to uh, like they're it's almost like they're running. They're running very lazy campaigns. And so I'm not sure why they're not trying to turn the issue as we talked about trying to turn the issue. The cost of living has become uh, very high um, in, you know, inflation has gone up. It's 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 taking its toll on the on the liberal government in terms of polls. If you look at the latest polls that are out, I am not sure why they are not trying to dovetail into that um, uh, into that issue as to what's happening out there. Right. See, I, I thought Del Duke had a good day yesterday, um, but I'm worried that it's a good day that doesn't advance his interest. Right. Like you, you guys know, I'm very sympathetic with schools and students issue. I think education is is vital, but it's what we talked about yesterday. I think if I'm running a campaign, I think I'm therefore in complete agreement with Jenny. Like, I think if I'm running the liberal campaign, I say to myself, I, I, I got to kill my baby. I got I got to abandon the thing that I love. about. I might want to talk about education. I might want to talk about schools and students. But I don't think that I can get anywhere that I need to be unless I have something persuasive to say on cost of living. And, you know, Ford yesterday didn't have the biggest bang of a day. He was kind of reannouncing license plate sticker renewals and sort of caps. But at least he was saying, here's a bunch of things I'm doing on cost of living. And he just was at least on, on the numbers. I just don't think you can stand in a windstorm and open an umbrella that says schools. I, I think if you're in a cost of living windstorm, you got to say, we're going to build a brick wall. Well, wait a second. So can you not create a fight out of the fact that you had um, all these kids home uh, for two years, not learning? Nobody thinks their kids got a full year of school during the uh, during the pandemic. And the conservative government wants to push for more online learning. And then you've got Del Duca saying, not only am I not going to do online learning, I know that your kids need to catch up. And so I'm going to reduce their class size to 20. There's a cleavage there. Is there a potential fight there? Matters? Uh, for sure. Um, yeah, I agree with all that. I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe it's, maybe that's going to, maybe he'll extend that. And the structural change today will be, we're absolutely going to like, you know, legislate out online learning or whatever, you know. Uh, but I like, I don't, I'm making but that Scott, up. I, no you idea. Talked about but you, I just but, don't but, think you can get, there. I think you got to focus on about, the issue, right? But we've talked about this before. You, 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 you like the option of, of online learning for, for kids. I don't. 
Really? Before, no? I, I hated it. I hated it with a passion. No, but, but with an option, if, if parents didn't, if we were worried about sending their kids to school. Well, in the middle of the pandemic, I felt like, yeah, I kind of had to at some point. But like, if you're going to ask me, like, do I think it ought to be an ongoing, consistent feature of the school system? No, I think it's got all sorts. Of, I think it introduces all sorts of perversities and pressures that are not, not necessarily helpful. Um, but, uh, but look, I, I also don't, I just, I, my fundamental point is a strategic one, David. It's, and it's where you are. It's just that I don't think that you can afford to burn. To, it, yes, I think it's an important issue. Yes, I think that I may have some political juice in it. But I don't. I think that as an opposition party coming from third place in a struggle to establish yourself as the second choice, you, you don't have the luxury of ignoring the most important issue in the province. Uh, I just think you got to you got to establish stable stakes on cost of living right now. But you can. But you, a hundred percent. I agree with Scott. hundred percent. I actually. I, I I don't think they're like mutually exclusive. I think that Del Duca can go on education and go on what he's strong on, but you still have to actually go on a contrast message. We all we we all yeah. know. People, it, nice that is what works. You're, you're like, it, like putting, put, you know, putting on the white gloves and, and, uh, and, and everyone being nice to each other. It's, it, uh, uh, it may make some people in, uh, Rosedale at, and at the Albany club feel very warm and fuzzy about how the election is going, but at the end of the day, it doesn't work. And so I think but he's not doing that to be fair. If you watch his availabilities, he's going really hard. Like he is drawing a contrast and he's saying sharp, clear. And by the way, he's, he's not actually, drawing he's, a contrast. It's, but it's not work. But it's not. No one's seeing it. Like it's so. So at the end of the day, it's no one's seeing it because that is not like the par parents aren't sitting there. Well, Scott, you're a parent. Maybe I. I could be wrong. They're not sitting there going, well, you know, twenty three people in the class versus twenty people in the class. Uh, they either they want their kids to go to school. They want their kids to not wear a mask. And then they're also worried about how much no. things are are costing. No. I if, every if I was twenty nine versus twenty, I think it get, I think that gets through. But I like again, I think if. Yeah, like, but look, Jenny's point about Jenny's point about for the head. Yeah, so to, to what you were saying, I think Jenny was leading there. The NDP are on dental care. Yesterday, at least, we're on dental care. Now, I can tell you, as a pollster, dental care is an enormously popular idea. There's a lot more people struggling with affordable with affording their dental care than you might think, and uh, and it's actually more popular than pharmacare as an idea to right. people yet I sense it's useless in the context of this campaign. Why is it that a really good and popular idea can be of no value in a campaign? Explain that to our listeners, Jenny. Well, if people's priorities change, right? Like our, 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 if we were having this, if the provincial election was happening this time last year, the priorities of, um, of the electorate are, are totally different, like a hundred percent diametrically different than what they were, uh, what they were last time. If you look from the federal campaign to now, so you're looking from last September to now they're different. And so people's priorities change. And I think that it's not David, that people don't, um, uh, uh, don't support policies in terms of, uh, dental care or healthcare. Healthcare has always in my lifetime for the majority of times I've been in politics, healthcare has always polled high up into the uh high up on almost uh, at the on, top on almost the always at the top and i can't think of an election where healthcare has actually like really been the the determining factor because people people it's an issue for people but at the end of the day they're voting like on the thing that is that is happening that, that they're looking at that's happening now and happening now are gas prices cost of living um and and the, and it's going up um, uh, it's going up continually, like inflation. Yesterday, the UK announced their infl their inflation rates, and it's at ten percent. It's it's the highest it's been, and we're we're always lagging in terms of what happens in uh, in Europe. We saw that during COVID. What happened in Europe and the UK? Uh, you know, usually within two to three weeks, it was uh, it was us. And so we're continuing to see the in, in, in inflation numbers um, uh, inflation numbers go up, the prices go up, and and I I think listen, it's good for Doug. It's it's uh, you know short campaign where we've got what twenty eight days, uh, twenty eight days left. I it's every day that the opposition doesn't go on cost of living and uh, uh, issues like that is a, a very good day for the Doug Ford campaign. Yeah, let me just add this one thought because I think Jenny uh, toward the end there really nails it, and it goes to your question. I think David, my personal theory is this: yes, healthcare policies matter. Yes, dental care matters. Yes, uh, schools and students matter. Matter to tons of people. But you got a wolf of the door phenomenon happening. It isn't just the cost of living has suddenly become the most important issue. It's that it's overwhelmed us. It's it's swept over 
the dike suddenly, right? Like it's all of it. Like what we lived for a long period of time with no interest rates, not uh, no discernible inflation in the economy, no discernible disruptions of those kinds. And now suddenly gas is skyrocketing. Suddenly interest rates are going up. Suddenly my neighbor who could sell his home for $300,000 over, over asking last week can't sell his home at all. Like everything is just, it's moving now. So it's the wolf at the door phenomenon. And you can come out and talk about dental care and people say, I'm sorry, I don't have time to focus on dental care right now. I, I, I'm I paying twice as much for hamburger and I'm scared that it could be three times as much by this time tomorrow. And so that's that's why I think you got to you got to demonstrate that you're you're also concerned like they are with that wolf. Right. Plus, your 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 issue these days needs to because we've been talking about this. Ford needs to come down. They need to keep bringing Ford down a few pegs. So your issue needs to be something that also uh, reflects negatively on him and forces people to reassess him. Right? Make him own it. He's he's the guy. He's in government for Christ's sake, right? And maybe it won't work, but that's got to be the prescription. It's got to be. Listen, man, this is under your watch. Yeah. But you're right, Scott. Maybe it won't work, Scott. But what choice does Del Duca that, or the opposition have? Well, they can do dental care day after day. And I think what will happen is it will be the third paragraph in a four paragraph story. And I just don't know that that's going to get you where you need to. Home sweet home, a place to create memories, a place to hang your hat, a place to be proud of and a place that is all yours. Our original sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association, says the dream of home ownership is slowly being dismantled brick by brick due to high housing prices difficulty saving for a down payment, and fewer homes being built. It is more difficult to buy a home now than it was, say, when I was in my 20s, but the benefit of home ownership remains the same. The stability and security provided by home ownership fosters vibrant and stable communities and improves quality of life, leading to opportunities and experiences to last a lifetime. Home ownership is the bulwark of Canada's middle class, so it's not surprising that 90% of parents surveyed in a recent Abacus data poll feel it is important that their child is one day able to own a home. But how? The best options, aside from borrowing from mom and dad, to help young buyers purchase a home is twofold. One, the government needs to consider changes that will dramatically increase the supply of housing to meet the existing demand. And two, increase the first-time home buyer's land transfer tax rebate from its current rate of $4,000 to $8,000. You'll be hearing a lot more from Maria over the next five weeks about Ontario's housing affordability crisis and what can be done to fix it. Because Maria wants to see more young people become homeowners, and that starts with building a home for everyone. Read Maria's plan at ahomeforeveryone.info. So Ford did something super interesting yesterday. He threw Harris and Eves under the bus on the 407. Mm -hmm. uh, he just flat out said that was a mistake. They shouldn't have sold that. I wouldn't have sold that. And because he is a stranger to that party and literally had no relationship with the Harris government of any kind, he's going to get away with that, right? I think there's two factors. One is, yes, that he doesn't feel any affinity, right? He's a populist. He's kind of the, he's the dopey A&W root beer populist, right? Uh, A&W root beer bear, right? He just wanders around and goes, well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, whatever, you know? Uh, and the second thing is what we talked about last week. It's the dumbass dividend, right? Where he's kind of like, hey, you know, I, I don't know how this stuff works, but I wouldn't have done that. And people go, huh, well. So yeah, he'll fully get away with it. It is so unpopular, the 407. It is the symbol. If you, if you were to do research around privatization uh, in, the, in Ontario, people would be very opposed, as I know from Hydro One, to privatization. And one of the reasons that they would be very opposed is the sale of the 407, which to them is prima facie evidence that the government either willingly or incompetently will get fleeced when it sells something like that. The public interest will get fleeced. Do you think Jenny, people even care yeah. about that anymore? I think um, they care about when they think about it. I'm not sure they're going around thinking about it. But, but if you bring so it long, up, they're angry it, about it. But that's so long ago. There's a whole generation of people that don't even know what the fucking issue is. I just yeah, but if you're sitting, in, if you're sitting trapped on the 401, and there's an empty highway, because I occasionally drive the 407, and it is, it's not like it's lightly used. It is empty. Um, it's pretty. It would be pretty frustrating. Um, 
to, to know that that's not available really to uh, to alleviate the demand on the system. It touches on two eternal issues. One, it touches on uh, c- cost of living because really it's about tolls. And two, it touches on uh, whether or not you're going to protect the public interest or whether you're in there just handing out cash to uh, some rich guys who've got like private access and private buddies. So I think it was smart for for uh, for Ford to try to seal off that vulnerability. To bring it up, that was the odd thing. He brought it up. I don't even think he was asked. I think he brought it up. Well, because he's looking at 413, he feels like maybe there's, you know, that, that, right. that set of anxieties is there. The question <clears throat> tolls on 413, I think, lingers, and he needs to shut mm-hmm. that down. Jenny, what do you think about this idea? Because you did it with uh, Harper in the 2004 and 2006 campaigns too, which is take something you think is a vulnerability and bring it up yourself and deal with it off the top. You're talking about like in, in 05, 06, when he brought up same-sex marriage? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was really smart. Um, yeah, listen, I think it's, 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 uh, it, they're, they're game days, game day decisions. And we talked, we've talked about this before in terms of same sex marriage in 2000 and, uh, 2000 and, and, uh, and five, um, which, you know, it's a, it was, a, it's a different world, uh, in terms of that debate in, uh, than now than what it was, uh, than what it was back then. So it was a vulnerability. It was, a, it was, it was a sword as well in certain, in certain communities, uh, um, uh, like it was a, sh- it was a shield for you guys in certain communities. It was, and, and so, um, uh, and I think I've said this before, n- no one seemingly knew. And I was, I was, I was not the most senior person on the campaign, but based on, uh, walking by doors and, uh, listening to what others said, that was a Stephen Harper decision to do, to do. He walked out and he did that him, he did that mostly him, uh, himself. He made that determination and it, and it, it stopped the debate for basically the 56 day campaign or what, whatever it was. So I think depending on the issue, I think it's extremely smart, like get pull yeah. the bandaid off, uh, get rid of it. Um, uh, have the debate. Uh, cause, cause when the, the media are, are covering, uh, covering an issue, uh, you know, new, there is new in news for a reason. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, all right. You know, I wanted to get to some innovative polling, but we're, a half hour has flown by already. So my gosh, we got to go. We'll save that for Monday, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have to end with our blessings and curses. <laughs> Jenny, do you have a blessing or a curse? Uh, my, listen, my blessing is going to be uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the provincial campaign because it's been very pretty. It's been standard so far. I think things can change. This is week one of the campaign. I think uh, we'll see what what happens. But uh, my blessing is for. Uh, uh, is for my friends in the in the PC party campaign in the war room uh, in the field. Things are going very very well, um, and try to just keep things going exactly how they're going now. Like you want low key, you don't want to get in the news. Sometimes there's an instinct to if we're not if we're not driving the bus, so to speak, if we're not driving the Yes Express, uh, that things are going <laughs> bad. And uh, uh, less news is better for any incumbent, not just not a Doug Ford incumbent government, not a in any incumbent government that is getting less news about uh, the campaign, or whether well, there's there's not a huge amount of uh, of of news newsy news happening, it's a good day for them. Right, right. All right, Scott. The mess express. Uh, I'm going to set a blessing. <laughs> not notwithstanding the discussion we had about whether liberals are wise to focus on schools and education versus cost of living. I my blessings to the liberal tour, and and I guess to Del Duca directly because. I think if you take a look at yesterday's announcement, um, he's out with a crowd of people. He was interacting with folks. He was literally holding and kissing a baby, right? That kind of like energy, good pictures, humanizing Del Duca. That's as important in terms of introducing him to people as, you know, these ads uh, that, that are running online. I thought the events looked good. Del Duca, if you watch him, is speaking extemporaneously, speaking comfortably, speaking smart, speaking clearly. So, you know, the liberal tour looks good. It looks buttered to the edge. It looks professional. And I just got to believe in an election campaign, that level of professionalism pays off, whether it's going to be in the debate, whether it's cumulative, whatever, but it looks good. It looks well done and they're performing well and you don't perform well and not have it matter. I just think it does matter. <clears throat> My curse goes out to both opposition parties, which is you need to just tweak your messaging somewhat so that the critique of Ford is the news lead, not your policy item is the news lead. 
it is more important for people to understand what Ford has done wrong to education than it is to Jenny's point for people to know whether you're going to be at 24 kids in a classroom or 20 kids in a classroom. So I know that in your statements, you've got both the critique and the policy, but the policy is what is emerging as the news. And you, frankly, you need the critique to emerge as the, as the news. That's such a killer good point. I hope that people hear that. That is perfectly said and really smart, Dave. Well, thank you, Scott. Well, I know that my endorsement thank and you. approval is all that you crave. Uh, it's, uh, that's totally made my day. Well, well I'm well, taking I'm out a sheet of cookies for you, pal. I'm really <laughs> proud. You're showing signs, boy. I'll be right over with a jug of milk. All right. Uh, while we're thanking people, I would like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our original sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association. Of course, I'd like to thank all you accursed for listening or watching uh, whatever you're doing today. Scott, Jenny, have a great weekend. Jenny, you rocked last night. Yeah, I'm going to go back and watch the conservative debate again on YouTube and clutch my nuts. <laughs> <laughs> all right, take care. See you, folks.